What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. We've got a great guest on tonight, uh, someone who is very familiar with a with an area that I spent a lot of my uh, guiding career in the winter up until I got married, which is Louisiana. And so excited to talk with him about his area. But we're really our, our focus on tonight's conversation is going to be talking about how diversifying as an angler, whether that be you know targeting different species or fishing different areas or traveling to fish, you know, in the long run, really makes you a better angler. Not not only is it fun to do that, but I mean, from every different avenue that you can explore in fishing, it's going to make you a better angler overall, which, you know, for people that take it seriously like myself is, is, a, is a great end goal. You know, it's not, I'm going to see how many redfish I can catch, but I want to be the best angler that I can be across the board. Um, so we're going to get into that with him. Uh, before I introduce him, definitely go check out Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. It's a great place to connect with other listeners and, uh, and, and kind of build a little community there. And then also go check out our Patreon page uh, if you want to help support us. Uh, on the back end, you can go to Patreon. We also upload weekly uh, extra content there, a lot of continued conversation from our podcast here and going in a little bit deeper uh, on Patreon. So you can go check that out. The links for that will be on the YouTube uh, description as well as on the show notes on any of the podcast um, platforms that you use to listen to the podcast. But that's enough of me talking. I'm going to go ahead and bring on our man, Devin. What's going on, man? It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> If, if, if I look off to like my left a little bit, just because I like have your screen down here, but yeah. then like the, the camera's right here, just so if, if I know people usually just listen, but if they're looking at it, I don't want them to think I'm, I'm crazy or disturbed or something. No, just, you're good. They're used the to way it. I, have my, uh, I do the same thing because I'm looking at my screen talking to you, and then I've got my DSLR up in front of me, so I'm like, it's, it's confusing. Gotcha. Go get over it. Go get over it. You know, you said you said something that 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 really struck me, and and that's the whole concept of uh, becoming becoming better. Right. right, becoming a better angler, and uh, I mean, I think everyone wants to catch more fish and have fun on the water, but you know, you fish long enough, you kind of learn that anyone can reel in a fish. That's not hard. Right, finding them and and getting them to bite is is that's where it's at. Like, yeah, if you can do that, you, you got it going on. And understanding why they're there. Yes, and, and it's, 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 it's sometimes <laughs> I mean that. That will be a forever journey. Yeah. But, but it's a it's a journey. It's not really a destination, right? Exactly. And uh, that that is kind of what got me hooked on fishing. Now I grew up fishing with uh you know with with my dad and with speckled trout, redfish. But it was the very standard fare of, um you know the inshore fishing ta- tackle is typical to and style of fishing is typical to Louisiana like live bait and popping corks, yeah. Carolina rigs, like nothing really, nothing really special. But uh, uh, you know, I, I joined the Marine Corps and ended, ended up in your neck of, in, in the woods. Just it just to uh, give some background here, I, yeah, I ended definitely. up joining the Marine Corps out of high school, and uh, uh, ended up in your neck of the woods, which North Carolina is awesome. It's absolutely beautiful. But I didn't fish while I was there for you know because I'm doing the the, the Marine Corps thing. Right. But at the time, I I just I don't know, man. It's just uh, I, I I just wasn't I I just really wasn't into fishing until. I got out of the Marine Corps and I'm, I'm sitting at home and I'm like, well, I've been drinking and uh, that really isn't all that anymore. And <laughs> it's just kind of bore sitting around like, well, what the hell am I going to do now? And I pulled the boat out of the garage, got it running, went out. And then ever since then, it has been nonstop. Heck yeah. So I wanted to get better. And uh, I, I use a lot of Marine Corps analogies for, for things just because it's, it's, it's what I'm familiar with. But uh, I saw that bass anglers were kind of like like the the, the special forces of fishing in a way, and and I learned this because uh, I eventually became a guide, and I take people out guiding, and uh, I, I love all my Louisiana brethren to death. Y'all are great, y'all are awesome, but some of the worst like worst anglers I had come out on that boat were from where I lived. <laughs> and and that's just because all they did was the live bait and popping cork thing and and just and just using being very one dimensional in in their approach. The guys that came on the boat that were and when and I took out several groups of bass anglers that were from out of state, but I did there there's this one group from Table Rock I'll never forget. And all I really had to do is like show them a picture of a fish like oh here it is and it swims over there. And that was it. And they were able to do, 
I just had to stay out of their way. Right, right. And I loved them. They were they were great. And and then but the thing that struck me is that after they caught like twenty speckled trout, they're like, well, like what else is there to do? And because we have this really uh, awesome speckled trout fishing in in Louisiana, I know as as a guide. Uh, if I had like four people in the boat, it was my goal to catch 100 speckled trout. The limit is 25 per person. Right. Now looking back on it, I'm kind of like, eh, you know, maybe I'm subscribing more and more to the idea that you know those fish are too valuable to only be caught once. But that's another train of thought, and I think that's something that just comes with the journey. Yeah, of, uh, I agree of, 100%. Of the inshore fishing. So I was like, well, I, I, I want to get into bass fishing, and uh, and this was about the same time that I went sight fishing with my buddy. He took me. He's like, "Dude, you gotta, you gotta try this out." So the whole concept of getting in a stand at an elevated position and and looking at the redfish and catching them is pretty alien at, at, at that point in time. It's like, well, well, you just use dead shrimp underneath a cork on the on the shoreline, or you throw gold spoons or something generic like that. And that day I went out with my buddy Ben and and blasted my first redfish from from a stand. I was like, there was no other way to catch these fish. <laughs> so that and my journey in bass fishing where I started going to uh, these impoundments uh, out of state, uh, like uh, Lake Conroe is a good example, um, the Tennessee River, uh, Chain of Lakes, like Lake Chickamauga, Naked Jack. Uh, you know, Logan Martin, Gunnersville, uh, a bunch of stuff in Florida. Um, that, uh, in a nutshell, if I just had to get, give you broad brushstrokes, I would tell anyone that uh, if you can learn how to throw a, a 10XD crankbait for bass that are in 20 plus foot of water in Lake Conroe, okay, and use electronics and, and understand how all that tackle works together to get a good presentation on that fish. You will absolutely demolish speckled trout in a whole new way. Yeah. Okay. You will do the same thing with the redfish in a whole new way. Um, I tell everyone like sight fishing is pr- probably like the most. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I was going to say it's the most easily available thing to do. I'll disagree. I was to say bass are because you can start flipping a Texas rig. There's bass across the street from me. I mean, they're everywhere. There's probably a bass within a mile of you somewhere right now. Right, There's a right. thick enough water in it. And, you know, you can go start flipping a Texas rig, and, and you'll be surprised where it is you find these stinkers. There, You start, you know, looking in urban areas and canals and ponds at the mall, and you're like, these things are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can oh, I don't need a boat. And I can, <laughs> I can just walk out there. And uh, red fishing, sight fishing, red fish, you can see them swimming in the water, You'll see redfish that don't eat. You'll see redfish that are sleeping. Um, you'll see other fish, and you'll know what those pushes look like because you can see everything happening in, in the, in the freaking water. So uh, I take time to learn, and this doesn't always equate to catching. It's a weird irony. It is that when you take time to try new baits, to try new areas, okay, you're going to spend a lot of time learning where fish aren't and how not to catch them. But in the long run, you catch more fish and you have more fun doing it. Yeah. Um, I think it is, uh, I think people's journey in inshore fishing dies when they stop trying new things. So like a good example is uh, a guy I know that owns a tackle store and he doesn't go fishing. And it's so because he, he just got tired of watching a popping court go down. Yeah. Okay. He got tired of doing doing the same thing. So, uh, we use a, uh, and uh, I mean, I, I would love to know if y'all do something like this in North Carolina. I have no idea. Uh, but we use this technique here in, uh, in Louisiana called the Ponce Train Pop. And what you're doing is you're throwing, uh, a, a jig head and, and a, a little three inch swim bait that's on that jig head. And the jig head weighs anywhere from you know, a quarter ounce to three quarter ounce, but typically three eighths, maybe half into fast moving water that's broken by bridge pilings and uh using slack line fishing so the line's not even tight putting a lot of slack in it's that jig can fall straight down behind that piling and i get swept away by the current and get in front of where those speckled trout are at yeah and uh, uh you're watching you know they bite when you see the line jump or you don't really feel the bite so you're using like a high vis monofilament you know right, that helps right. some people like braid and uh uh it is 
once I learned how to fish that way in Lake Pontchartrain, where we have all these big bridges and, and they can absolutely get loaded down with speckled trout, but you could go there with live shrimp and a popping cork and a Carolina rig all day long and not catch them if you're not using that specific technique. I've taken that elsewhere to excel in the bass world because a lot of bass anglers don't use that kind of technique. So bass yeah. don't see and and then you end up whacking the bass in, in, in a whole new way. Uh, it works really well for redfish in deep water, but um, I, I know we were we were texting we text messaging back and forth the other day, and I was kind of saying like, well, like the whole deep water red fishing is kind of convoluted because you're really just going to catch them shallow anyway. I mean, why yeah. would you go mess around with a bunch of redfish in 20 foot of water when you could just go, go into a shallow. pond and you can see them? You're right. You can see them push for sure. For so sure. Uh, what I do today and this is my full-time job so 100 percent how i make a living is i use all i've created online courses that teach all these things that, that i've learned and how it is they uh, uh uh relate to inshore fishing in louisiana is is very specific i do have uh, uh customers that are anywhere from texas to virginia but the, the majority of them are in Louisiana, and I focus on that just because, like, you know, in South Carolina, they have a six-foot tide, okay? It's, it's a completely different animal, and we just don't have that. Our, our tide here in Louisiana is very small and forgiving, right? So, so there, are, there are things that are inherently different. Um, yeah. We have a big, muddy Mississippi River that freshens everything up. You know, we, we've had a lot of snow melt. Uh, and rainfall in the last few years, and we've had record Mississippi River like levels and areas that were really salty are completely fresh now, and that's changed the the landscape as well. But anyway, so uh, I guess the point I'm getting at is that is now what I do inside my courses at at LAFB Elite, and it's it's very rewarding because then because you have to be open minded to even. If you want to succeed in fishing, you got to be open minded, yeah. right? That's it. And and I think you kind of have to be open minded to say, hey, I want to take online fishing courses, or I take online courses for anything that I can learn about to, to include fishing. Like like Bass uh, Bass University is a great example. Yeah. Right. So and I'm trying to learn because if you want to learn electronics, those are the guys you want to look at. Those are the guys you want to pay attention to because they're doing it day in day out. Yeah. So, uh, well, tell, uh, tell me this being there in Louisiana, y'all, y'all have such a diversity of, of fish and of ways to target fish and of places to target fish. And when you're looking at it from like, you know, a, a be, more of a beginner fisherman standpoint, like where is a good place to start? Where, where do you think your, your most learning is going to come from as far as it's, do I go target, you know, largemouth bass and learn a lot from them? Do I go target the speckled trout or redfish is, is, is there something that kind of short a fish that shortens the learning curve? Would you say, or did it for you? Uh, I think, I think bass fishing would be where it's at because they're so easily, uh, uh, available. Yeah. They're very accessible. They're, they're everywhere. You can catch them off the side of the road. You can catch them in neighborhood ponds. But then after that, I would go after redfish. Um, and, and I say that because, uh, Redfish are also, I mean, anything that's under 27 inches is, is a juvenile, so they don't go out to spawn. They stay in the marsh year round. During the summertime, I'm sure y'all experience the same thing in North Carolina. Our speckled trout kind of move out, and they're a little more difficult to to, to access if you don't have um, a, a boat or just the right kind of boat. Right. Like if you got a 12 foot John boat, you're not going out into the Gulf or Breton Sound or anything like that. I mean, you you could, you might, you just might not come back. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but redfish oh, are are so much closer and they're so much hardier. And f- sight fishing for them is awesome. And this whole thing of finding clean water, you see it a lot. People ask, well, where is clean water? Or there won't be any clean water after this cold front. It's going to drop the water levels and, you know, beat it to chocolate milk. And But here with that river water, that freshness that we have here in Louisiana, you get these big grass mats that kind of set up like um, hydrilla mats, like what you see in bass lakes. And uh, But it's not as tough. It's a little softer, you know, so lures foul up real easy on them. And, and it's really good to use a weedless solution. But that grass acts as like a filter. And you can have dirty nasty river water 
from the Mississippi River on one side, and on the other side of that mat, it is like this this, this bottle of water. And I, actually, the cleanest water I've ever sight fished red fished. And I've, I've, I've gone sight fishing in Florida. The cleanest water I've ever sight fished red fished in was like 600 yards from the Mississippi River in Venice. So yeah, it's, it's crazy clean. how much it can clean up Dude. down there in, in, in it, that zone. It is. Even over in the Biloxi Marsh. I mean, it can be the dirtiest water you've ever seen. And then a week yeah. later, it can be absolutely crystal clear. It's it's a cool it's a cool place. Um, yeah. So let's step into, you know, sight fishing redfish a little bit. As you've kind of, you know, you've got such a great area to do that down there. What are some of the things that you've kind of learned through that and, and, and ways that you like to target those fish and, and maybe some of the advantages that you found for, you know, as a sight fishing angler there in Louisiana? I found that very rarely do you see them just like sitting in one spot relating to a piece of cover like, um, like a bass would. Yeah. Uh, a bass can just hover next to a stump indefinitely. But it seems like redfish, and redfish do stop and chill in one spot, but it's, it seems like for the most part they, they got to keep moving. And I had a biologist explain it to me that um, it's the way their gills are designed. They need to, uh, it's, uh, what, what, there's a fancy $10 word for it, something like uh, ram-fed gills, but they have to keep moving, not quite okay. like a shark. But, but they do need to, so, cause I would go side fishing and I'd have an awesome approach. Uh, so, so just to back up a little bit there, like, uh, to me, the approach is like when you enter a pond and you're moving towards where it is that you think redfish are going to be, where you think, or you know that they're going to be, and you don't want to go when they're, you know, uh, beating the side of the boat with a paddle or, I mean, just obvious stuff like that. You don't right. want to be loud. You want to be stealthy. Right. So. I found usually when people aren't catching redfish, it's because their approach could have been better. Um, it's for the most part, these fish aren't pressured. I, I think they will readily bite anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if, if you got on them good and they don't know you're there and, and they feel warm and fuzzy, they'll, they'll bite almost anything. Yeah. But then there's many times where I, I've had... Dude, you can find, and, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, is you get these fish that are so not pressured because there's just so much marsh out there. I've had redfish come up and check out the trolling motor because they just didn't know what it was. Oh, yeah. Right? And then they, then they, then they, then they get spooked. But um, <laughs> they, you would see redfish that you get a great approach on, you get an awesome presentation on them. You don't line them. Everything's perfect. And they just shrug the bait off and they just keep swimming. And, and so, uh, me and a buddy of mine were paying attention to their fins and if their fins were out like a shark and, uh, it, it's kind of like, they're pretty much going to eat every time, yeah. but the fins were folded in and their mouths are just kind of moving like that. They weren't, wouldn't eat. Yeah. And, and it's not every time, but it was like maybe. Uh, seven times out of ten, and those are usually probably fish that aren't traveling. They're probably laid up in one spot and and not moving yes. as, as much. So, uh, yeah, that that is that's a redfish from Florida to you know Maryland. Um, yeah, the like redfish that. in Florida really surprised me how easily spooked they were. Yeah, they were Just that, very that pressure. They were not, they, they get hammered all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, there's more people fishing in Florida. There's something like four times the population of Louisiana and two or three times the amount of licensed anglers. Yeah, it's, so. it's crazy. Um, uh, one thing that I kind of always share with people is I think one of the biggest benefits to, you know, getting a redfish to eat that I've found, and when I mm -hmm. when I figured this out, it definitely, you know, it, it changed the way that I targeted them a, a little bit, but it, you've got to let them feel like they found the bait. Like if you, if you force a bait on a fish... It's a very good way of putting it. You know, it. then then a lot of times that, that ends up spooking them. But if, if you let them feel like, oh, check this out, I just found a shrimp here, that that's, they're usually going to eat it. You know, when you slide it in there real fast or make a cast too close to them where you're forcing it on them, a lot of times it spooks them. Now, in Louisiana, I've definitely had fish that I've forced the bait on and they've still hammered it. But Louisiana is a is a very different, you know, at times can be a very, very different you know, ballpark than a lot it can, of other It can places. be pretty easy at times. Yeah. It really, it, it really can be. And, and so I think that's good because you want people, you, you want to catch, you know, at the end of the day, you're launching a boat, you're picking up a fish and rod so, so you can catch. And so then you can get feedback. 
But that's another reason I think sight fishing would be good um, over even better than bass fishing uh, because you get that feedback. Even if you don't, uh, dude, if I'm in a pond, and uh, okay, so there's this one pond I went to in, in Homa. Uh, I, I found this, you know, doing my research on Google Earth and old maps online and went back there and, and found it and it was went and looked at it and it was awesome there i counted like 200 something redfish just cruising up and down the shoreline and caught like three and they just weren't having it and 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 so i talked to a couple of buddies of mine about it and they're like yeah you know that's lake boudreau lake boudreau gets hammered all the time by guys from the ifa and uh you know elite redfish series and whatnot and uh i was like well okay well that, i guess i guess that makes sense <laughs> I, I described the fish to them and they knew well, where I was at. Oh, they're like, oh, you're in, you're you're over there by Lake Boudreau. And I was like, oh, how'd you know that? <laughs> like, because they're like, because the fish are dangerous. Everyone jerks. knows, <laughs> dude. It was everything in my power to. Uh, but you can get my point here is is that at least I could see them. Yeah. And I know that they're there, and then you can start work from it. It's one of the things I love about sight fishing redfish because you can just go in a pond and be like, well, I didn't see anything. So yeah. there's nothing there, whereas you can cast at a shoreline that a bass is on, and maybe he just wants that a creature bait and watermelon red, and that's it. And and you can cast everything else and not catch him, and you still don't know right if, there's that, if he was there or not. That unknown. But the redfish you still get the feedback, and it's still fun. Yeah. And and so that's what I would I, I would tell people. I, I do all the time. But for whatever reason, like here in Louisiana, man, it just doesn't, I don't know if this is just Louisiana or if it's like inshore anglers in general, but it just doesn't really seem to catch on as well as going and just whacking 50 speckled trout, right? right. You know, right. people, I don't know, man, I, I think I think some people still go fishing for groceries, which is fine. I, mean, I, I can't, I keep any fish, or, you know, yeah. but just not yeah. like what, what I used to, Uh I remember 2017, I spent the entire summer of 2017 making this course called Sight Fishing Mastery School, where I'm like, this is going to be sight fishing for Louisiana. It's going to take anyone who does not even know what a redfish or sight fishing is. It's going to break it down Barney style for them, show them the equipment that they need, how to do it, you know, going over approaches like what I was talking about. And uh, uh, practically, I'm not going to say nobody bought it. Plenty of people bought it enough to make it well, worth my time, but it didn't do anywhere as well as like inshore fishing 101, which is really just um, the found, foundational knowledge of inshore fishing in Louisiana, uh, fishing with life bait and popping corks, Carolina rigs, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. All right. So yeah, people know, people sometimes want to take that you know that bird's eye view instead of really focusing in on a certain point, which can be good. You know, if you don't know what you yeah. want or what what you're going to enjoy, that can be important. But one of the things you just said that really had me thinking is like. The fact of sight fishing, whether it be redfish, bonefish, tarpon, permit, whatever it is, bass even, uh, mm -hmm. it, it can shorten that learning curve as far as how to approach fish uh, with a bait and how to get them to eat because you're getting that immediate feedback. Like a bass or a speckled trout, you, you make that cast in there and you're like, well, maybe I didn't work it right, you know. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, I was a little off to the side and didn't see it. But the, with the, when you're sight fishing, it's like okay, I obviously didn't work it right or my angle was wrong because I saw the fish, he saw my bait, he didn't need it. Yeah. You know, it, it shortens that that up a little bit and kind of helps you when you're fishing and can't see fish, you know, relate a little bit more to what might be going on underwater. And granted, they're all different species, but again, we're talking about the whole idea of each fish does make you better. Yeah, for side fishing, you really only need one rod at, at the end of the day. Um, Don't tell my wife that. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, exactly. Now, if you were to go, if I were to go and seriously uh, fish like uh, like Lake Conroe or something, especially okay. anything that has a lot of different kinds of depth, in that boat, there's going to be, don't be shocked if there's 40 rods in there. Uh, there's going to be at least 20 because there's all kinds of different techniques and, and, and different lines and, and, and lures and, and everything else. And it's just... You can, you know, so, so this is why I, I tell people like, well, plug into watching Bassmaster, uh, not because I'm, 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 I'm not terribly crazy about watching someone else compete on a body of water. I'm never going to fish on, but it's the small things you're looking for. Right. Right. So if you see, if you see a guy that has like 20 rods on the deck of his boat and they're all like just tangled to hell and back and, and everywhere, he's having a tough day. 
<laughs> okay, but if you have a guy that has like one or two rods on the deck of his boat, he knows what he's doing. He's got them dialed in. Right. Um, so uh, I've taken that same approach with with speckled trout because I I have a bass boat. Dude, uh, dude, and, and at the beginning of 2018, I was in the market for a new boat, and I was like, I did the bay boat. I still have my aluminum flat boat, which is awesome for sight fishing because, you know, if you run over like an old pipeline from the 40s or something, it's not a big deal. <laughs> right, you know, right. it's just it's a crappy old aluminum boat. And uh, uh, but I was like, well, you know, I know I want to do this bass fishing theme more often, and I really like the layout of like using a foot pedal trolling motor and uh uh you know electronics on the bow and at the console and uh, i like sitting down i like going fast i like having a low wind profile well, and what i mean by that is like you know if you have a bay boat the big t-top and all that and that wind's blowing it's going to blow that thing all over the place right. man but if you have a boat that sits low to the water you can you, you can have your way with with the wind a, a little bit more Definitely. um it it takes getting used to sitting down so you can't see as much when you're driving but then it's like I'm sitting down, and it's not like sitting down like on a bench rest in a bay boat. You're in a lazy boy with your feet kicked out in front of you, and it is so nice, especially for like those long runs. Like I might, uh, I might be, you know, if the wind, if the, if the wind's laying down, and the water's calm. I could launch a slide L and go fish East Biloxi Marsh. Yeah, I just got to cross like Bourne and the Mississippi Sound and all that, and you know that's a long ride, man. And then if you know if I if I can sit on the lazy boy while I'm doing it, kind of tuck in behind the console, it's nice. Yeah, for so sure, for sure. That takes getting that 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 part is, is 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 really hard for me to get back in the flat boat or ride in a bay boat where I'm like standing like hanging on to the center console like <laughs> it's gonna shit knock out of me the whole time. Uh, but the ability to use casting tackle and a foot pedal trolling motor to catch speckle trout especially doing the ponce train ponce train pot you know jigging there's a little three inch swim baits like i was talking about dude i have so much more power and control over how to position the boat uh because i'm not taking my hands off the the, the rod and reel to move a trolling motor or whatever i'm using my right, foot right. and uh, uh i have a lot more power and control over over the lure so there was a day, uh, well, I mean, it's 2021, so this would have been fall of 2019. Me and my buddy Jamie went out uh, to those same bridges I was talking about, and be- between both of us caught 153 speckled trout. Now, wow. we released those fish, but but that's 153 keepers, a, a speckled trout. And, and what was neat about these fish is that it wasn't like, you know, you could just throw a bait out there and, and you would catch them. You would have to use that specific technique and have to cast it back to that fish so you might see oh so i just uh, uh, i got thumped off that corner of that piling and uh, maybe the fish didn't fully commit to it or maybe it had a following fish the fish is just curious and is just following it looking at the bait and you happen to see it as you're reeling a lure back up so you're like okay okay all right, there's a fish down there you might cast back to him three more times and then catch him and 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 just the way i'm able to work in and out of those pilings and around other boats you know always keeping a polite distance and whatnot but it it i couldn't i could not have done that in in my bay boat or my flat boat it is just it's impossible yeah it is it's just it's just the thing's just too big and bulky and would be blown around and uh uh that's that's why i fish um a, a bass boat and i use it for sight fishing redfish too uh, it's not really it's not really my favorite boat to sight fish redfish in because they stern squat a whole bunch and uh, uh, so the whole shot really could be better but honestly man you look at the guys fishing at you know IFAs and uh, elite redfish series uh, events they're all in 25 foot bay boats or larger anyway right and right. and a lot of the best ponds you're in are gonna be no shallower than two foot. But- Two foot plenty of water for, for almost anything that you could realistically fish out of. So um, it doesn't hold me back from side fishing, but I prefer the flat boat and a casting platform for that. Yeah, so. it, it's it's cool, though, to see how, you know, there's not one boat. Each angler kind of finds what they like to do, like, you know, and, and how they like to fish. And, and that that's I think that's how many people have, like, three or four boats before they, like, settle into one or, like, one style of boat because... They're like yeah. learning their style of what they want to do and what they want to be able to accomplish, and um, that's cool. I, I I really think the foot pedal trolling motor is killer. I mean, it, it would be hard for me guiding to run one of those for the simple fact of 
needing the bow space for, for clients. But if I was fishing by myself all the time, 100%. My brother fishes a bunch of bass tournaments and he has uh-huh. a blazer bay and, or he has a blazer bass boat, not a blazer bay. And he, uh, man, when I am able to run it, I about throw myself out of the boat, you know, for the first <laughs> three to four minutes, but then I like get the hang of it and the groove of it again, running the trolling motor. And, uh, it's super fun. It's, and it's just, a, like well, you said, you never have to take your hands off the reel. You're constantly able to fish. Uh, the the old tracks has works just like any eye pilot um it's it's very strange how because you put your foot on it and most foot pedal cable steer trolling motors is is just a cable right right but this has sensors built into that can tell when you're pushing forward pushing backward and it uses like a, a servo to assist you so it's kind of like it's like power steering, yeah. really. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I still, I'm still able to put a cooler. Uh, like when I take the fast boat to go side fish, I still put a cooler up on front. Uh, I'll stand on top of that, um, and then I can I have the remote around my neck. Right. 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 So, mm-hmm. but uh, but I mean that that's an old tracks too. You know that's I mean that's it's an old tracks. Like, yeah. If I don't, let's, they can do it all. We don't we don't <laughs> want anyone's wife overhearing what it costs. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. So. Uh, uh, but uh, okay, so something else that people probably ought to. I'm I'm, I'm getting sidetracked here. Casting platforms. So when you guided in in, in the Biloxi Marsh, yeah. and now I'm assuming you 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 had like a skiff yep. that you pull around. Yep. Okay, so did did you use a platform at all? Yeah. So I I, I run a Maverick HPXS is my flat skiff. Oh, wow. um, and I do have a, a bow casting platform on that and a pulling platform. So it's all. How tall is it? Do what? How tall is that? Platform? My bow okay. casting platform is only about a foot, um, okay. a little over a foot. And then on top of the boat, you know, you're sitting about two, two and a half feet out of the water. But the pulling platform, you're sitting, you know, head, your head's probably a good, you know, 10 feet, nine feet off the water where your eyes are, you know. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, probably, probably around nine feet off the water. Do you. Uh... You know, something I, I, I kind of learned the easy way um, is I thought having a taller casting platform. Now, now I assume you, you would be fly fishing with, with the, the, the setup you're talking about. Yeah, fly okay. fishing. And I'm not, I'm never, I've never been a fly fishing purist. I do love fly fishing. Yeah. I just like fishing. I, I, I mean, I have just as much fun throwing a bait caster as I do a fly rod. I mean, I like, to, like we're talking about diversifying and being good at all of which maybe sometimes is our downfall, you know, like we're trying to do too much or I'm trying to do, do too much. It's like, just focus on your redfish, you know, but, but I, I yeah. like, I like getting better at all of it. I mean, even offshore fishing, I feel like you can just learn so much and, um, you know, that you can apply across the board and just become a better angler. I don't know. It's, it, I think, I think so. And I, well, I, th- I think it's what people need to do though. It's just like, so, so like I never got into fly fishing and yeah. everyone's like, why haven't you done that? Yeah, it seems like something you would do. And I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, I, I guess that would, if I had to sum all this up, is that that's just what this boils down to. Like you, person right now who's listening to this podcast, next time you go fishing, just tie on something different and let that be the only thing you fish with all day. Yeah. Or don't go to where, don't go to where you, where, where, don't go to where you know you're going to catch fish. Right. Go somewhere else because if you go there and you catch fish, well, you should have. Okay. Right. Then if you don't catch fish, then well, you you should have. Right. But if you go and catch them in a brand new area, and then you learn why those fish are there, you've just put another feather in your cap, and hey, it's an attaboy. It feels really good when you find fish on your own in a completely new area. Definitely. So, so I guess you know, so like I'm, I'm sitting here feeling you out about you know casting platform height. I thought that taller was better, and dude, I've been in like eight foot platforms where like all in all, you're eight foot off the water, and you ended, I ended up missing so many fish. I think mostly just because I wasn't used to it. But I mean, the, the redfish can see you too, and then the wind like blows the lure so far, and then it doesn't go where you thought it was going to go. And and then I found what really works best is just not, to not even have a stand or to stand on a cooler yeah. because then the redfish get. So this was sight fishing with a buddy of mine from Florida, and I went out in his boat. He has a setup very much like yours, like what you described. And honestly, dude, I was hating it. Okay, because I was just like, this is not what I'm used to. But anything that's worth doing, worth learning, is probably going to be something you're not used to. Yeah, definitely. All right, it's going to be uncomfortable. 
And what I noticed is that redfish were swimming right up to the boat. I could smack them with a rod if I wanted to. When we were using our uh, the, the big five foot casting platform, it, that wasn't it happened rarely, right? Yeah. So, because uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's for anyone who's listening to this right now, well, this is this is this is my first time being being on 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 this podcast and getting to know your host. And so, so I'm, I'm curious, like, hey, so, so what, 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 what are you running with? Yeah, you know? for sure. And, and it's, you know, everybody's got their own fishery, their own style, their own, you know, way that they like to target fish. But I, I agree. I mean, you know, we've become so advanced in our technologies and our techniques that sometimes it can be, you know, too much. And I'm with you. I think there's days where having a five foot platform is nice to have and you can see fish from far away. But also sometimes I feel like standing on my foot high casting platform, I'm too high and the fish are seeing me and they're spooking off me. So, you know, it it really just depends on, on the scenario and the day. And I don't think there's any right answer. It's just kind of figuring out what works best for you and learning, you know, you know, how to, how to fish off of your platform. Like if, if I were to go, you know, tomorrow and, and try to go sight fish off of somebody's bay boat, um, I'd probably struggle with it. But if you put me on the bow of like a polling skiff and somebody was pulling me around, you know, what I'm used that's to. That's the way to do it. That, yeah. That's how I'm going to comfortably catch fish. But that, it's not necessarily that it's the way. It's just what I've kind of become accustomed to or taught myself mm-hmm. to fish that way. And, and in a way, it's almost, you know, you think, oh, this is the way to do it. But it's really, you know, it's however you feel comfortable and however you have the means to get out there and do it. Um, that's one of the bummers about sight fishing, you know, saltwater is you do kind of need a boat, you know, you need that elevation, not that you can't do it out of a kayak or a paddleboard, but you know, it, it takes a little bit of spending money to get out there and, and give it a shot as to where, you know, some of the, the simpler tactics as far as red fishing and total trout going, you can maybe do it from the bank or, you know, do it from a canoe or, you know, you've got some other options, but um, so what would you say, this is just kind of a personal question here, mm-hmm. you know, if you, down there in Louisiana, what is your fish that you, if you've got the perfect weather conditions, the perfect day, like what gets you fired up? What do you want to go do? Man, uh, that's, that, that's tough. Uh, <laughs> if uh, lately, okay. So I, I would say like top water speckled trout, like some kind of artificial lure going to catch speckled trout jigging them on the bridges is is really fun uh but lately our speckled trout population just hasn't been doing well and and i'll just i'll just leave it at that like this uh, the spawning stock biomass is down below the the threshold we want it to be at and we are not i mean the speckled trout fishing is a shadow of what it was 10 years ago but so 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 for that reason i'm not really inclined to go catch a bunch of 12 inch speckled trout right all right you know uh but if, if if the speckled trout fishing were uh more like what it was 10 years ago i'll be like speckled trout gosh darn it uh right. but man then 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 but there's then there's the whole redfish thing and there is nothing like just getting into an awesome redfish pond where everything's clean it's like you're in an aquarium especially here in Louisiana where you have that that freshwater influx. So in our uh, pre-interview chat, uh, I had mentioned that I was in this one place in Venice where you know I'm in my stand, I'm looking down in, in this super duper clean water pond and I saw a black tip shark and a bass swimming side by side and that made the day for me. I mean, it was, and it wasn't something like, I think it was a bass. I'm like, I see him. That is a bass. Right. Right. And it was just so absurd and crazy. And so you have, I mean, I grew up fishing the Bluxy Marsh and and I guided out there and going to the, for me, going to the Bluxy Marsh is like the equivalent to like driving to Walmart. Like I've done it a thousand times. There's nothing exciting about it. Like I'm not saying the Bluxy Marsh isn't exciting, but for me, Venice and a lot of the areas that are influenced heavily by the uh, Mississippi River is relatively new. And because I didn't start fishing it until um, four or five years ago uh, when I fished the Louisiana Saltwater Series, which is kind of like a, a like a small tournament, redfish tournament trail. Sweet. And that's something else I would tell people to do. Like, dude, go fish a, go fish a redfish tournament because you're going to meet you know, a, a lot of people who are friendly and are knowledgeable and and hopefully know things that you don't know that you don't know that they can shed light on 
right. and, uh, and 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 that's another way to become better. And um, uh, guiding kind of works in the same way because you're under pressure to catch fish. But uh, I was always under the impression uh, that river water is bad and it's going to ruin. Uh, and it is so not the case. The best, dude. If it, it, we fished a tournament, redfish tournament at a Slidell, and ran from there all the way down to Delacro. Wow. And like we had to stop and refuel. Right. I mean, that's you have guys who will be, you know, in uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi, and will run to the mouth of the to Venice. And it's just because of the, the fish there are that much. They have those little short, square tails, and, and they're just really, really tall. They're they, they tournament really, fish. Really heavy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 to throw some numbers out there, like I know like a, a seven-pound slot fish in Florida would be regarded as being like a heavy fish. Right, right. Like right. That's, you catch 14 pounds, and in a, in a, almost anywhere in Florida, you're going to land in the money if you don't win. And, and, and I'm not an expert on Florida redfish tournaments, but I did in my research look at some numbers. And so, so hey, you know, if you're listening and I'm wrong, tell me in the comments below. That's, that's the right, right, right. Um, but, dude, 14 pounds in a, a Louisiana redfish tournament, you know, the format being two slot redfish, it isn't going to get you anywhere. Um, I remember one tournament we fished out of Grand Isle and we ended up running – uh, from Grand Isle, and that's all salty water. Anywhere there's water's really salty, the fish tend to be a little bit skinnier. You want to go find where grass is and, and whatnot. And uh, the winning weight was like 17.01 pounds, and everything else was like the next four or five spots down from there is like 16 something pounds. Golly. It was just it was insane. Uh, uh, I remember that at Lake Brujero spot i was talking about where they had all these just fat hammers swimming around there's a 28 incher that on the boga went 13 pounds okay now he's over a slot you know he's too long but just barely just like, <laughs> like yeah oh, how can't you be getting shorter man and where then, are the dolphins but, uh, at <laughs> yeah i yeah right yeah dolphins please go in there make Come nibble his tail a little bit <laughs> well the, the, and the, then that brings up the whole other topic is that now, now you got to catch redfish at don't have questionable looking tails yeah right so so that makes it tough because then you can't really target fish like that but you can't there's no behavior that fish with perfect tails have uh, or there's no spot you know that they're going to be you just kind of <laughs> catch them on, oh, if you know where those right. fish live then you figured something out fish with yeah. shorter tails <laughs> so uh, uh i would say sight fishing man because yeah. you get that feedback you can get in there you don't need a lot to get started. I know kayaking is, is big and, and, and popular and all that, but uh, uh, in all fairness, for w what you would pay to get into a kayak, you can get a John boat with a little two-stroke on the back of it. Okay, you don't need a whole lot of horsepower because you don't need to go far. Like all the best redfish stuff is, is going to be closer to where you launch the boat. And if you have a little John boat, you, can, you don't even need a, a, a marina. There's... Uh, it's, it's what I was doing today down by Empire and Venice is I was looking for places I can just kick my flatboat off the side of the road. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, and I, I found some spots, but you know, like there's some stuff on the Mississippi river I was looking for and it's all rocked up and it's, it's kind of questionable, you yeah. know, and I yeah. just, and don't, don't want to mess with that, but, uh, <laughs> you have that added advantage and it, less, less is more. And, and with sight fishing, you can, uh, uh, I think you're able to to get more done. I think you're able to have more fun, and uh, you're able to learn more and become a better fisherman. Yeah. I've had people tell me that they're oh, I'm a, I'm good at fishing, and it's like as soon as it's like okay, well anyone who says that isn't, all right? Because it, Kevin Van Dam isn't walking around going, well, hey, I'm I'm good at fishing. Like he just everyone just knows he's good right. at fishing, right? Right. Van Damme, right? So uh, there's this. So I'll tell the story about my. My cousin that came down from Georgia, he hauled his bay boat down, and uh, I drove it for him. We went out to Breton Sound and uh, limited out on speckled trout. And they these were, I say fat, uh, just here in Louisiana we have smaller speckled trout, uh, but they were all fish that were, you know, uh, around 16 to 20 inches, you know, so they were nice fish. And, uh, uh, and considering that our minimum length is 12 inches. Right, right. right. Yeah, but, 16 to 20 inch trout's a good trout anywhere. Yeah, you know? I, 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 I would be happy to catch that, that anywhere. But, yeah. you know, it, it isn't like we were, like, just 
dealing blows to 25 inch fish left and right. Right, you know? right, but right. We we caught we limited out on fish. It was one one of the best trout bites I've been on in my life. It was it was just insane. So the next day I was like, well, we'll take out my little my aluminum flatboat and we'll go uh, sight fish redfish. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm ready because he had a bunch of confidence built from catching all those speckle trout but it, in all fairness it's like all you do is cast and reel them in right you know right. And it, it was like you went out to you know, you know it was like you piloted your boat out there and found them so yeah. but uh but he had fun and that's what's important and you know good family time and all that dude i think the day after that i don't remember the exact number but it was something like four we, we saw 40 something redfish and that's kind of how i gauge these trips by how many fish i see and then how many are caught and I gave him shots on on a lot of them, but uh, he didn't catch a single one. And and there were uh, sight fishing trips uh, that I've I've guided, but in, in a bay boat like with a platform uh, that you can fit like two or three people up front. So yeah. so because it's, it's more of like a fun social fishing kind of thing than it is like we are serious anglers kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, these poor customers, man, like they're like, yeah, yeah, we can, we can sight fish. Sure. That sounds great. Let's get out there. And it, it typically anywhere from 50 to 70 something redfish is, is what they would see. And, uh, I mean, we would end up having to catch these fish so they could go home with something. Right. 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 It's a tough game when you haven't done it. You know, when you, you, yes. you can accurately cast to a, a baby pool, I'll call it a baby pool. Like think about, you know, a, a 15, not a, even baby pool is hard for a lot of people to hit. But it's, it's very accurate to cast to a zone when you're trout fishing. You know, it's, it's much different yes. when you need to put it in, you know, you've got two feet of space that you need to land your jig for the redfish. I mean, it's a much different game. And, God, you see people get frustrated and fall apart. But it, it well, you some, see the fish and he's swimming. Like right, the, the, right, right. The, the time is down. you got to get it. you got to get it done right so they, 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 they get kind of get a little stressed out and rush themselves. And that what will make you such a better angler like i i was pretty good at at shooting uh you know doing shooting packages and stuff in, in the marine corps but then i had this this old timer over out of the range and uh part of his repertoire is he wanted us to do um like uh, a quarter mile runs and and a, a bunch of you know crossfit style exercises and then shoot and then we're all just throwing rounds left and right and and our we don't have the cool little pretty uh, a rat's nest in the middle of a rat's hole in the middle of the target anymore. And now it's just, it looks like someone shot with a big shotgun. And, and so it's like, you do, you learn better when you're, you're underneath a little bit of physiological stress. And there's nothing like seeing that fish swimming towards the boat. And you're like, you have 15 seconds before he gets spooked. Right. And then right. you got to make a good cast on it. And that's why I think anyone that's listening to this, your next fishing trip needs to be a sight fishing trip. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I think with that, man, we can probably wrap this up. We're at a good time limit. And, and for those okay. of y'all listening, um, if y'all want to slide over on the Patreon, if you are a Patreon, we're going to we're gonna dive in for a few minutes into some of Devin's favorite lures that he likes to sight fish for redfish with, um, which, you know, some days it doesn't matter. But someday when it does matter, you want to have a good arsenal of, of choices uh, of what you want to throw to those fish. So, man. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Let me switch back over to this screen. Thank you so much for coming on and, and doing a podcast. We'll definitely have to do more. And, and tell people that are listening how they can kind of find you um, and, and check out your courses and all that before we log off. Okay, so uh, I've, I've got probably the thing I think people are going to dig the most would be the YouTube channel. And that would be youtube.com slash LA Fish Blog. And then... Uh, my original website, Louisiana Fishing Blog, uh, is lafishblog.com. But again, more of that uh, like public content I make is really, that focus is more on the YouTube channel now. Yeah. All my courses, to include free courses, like winter fishing success, fall fish location, elements of effective fishing, uh, that's all at lafbelite.com. Okay. And uh, you'll see all those links on, on the front page when you navigate there. Cool. And I'll drop those links, you guys, too, into the show notes for the podcast as well as the, uh, the YouTube YouTube video. But, yeah, that's awesome. perfect, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Guys, thanks for checking out another episode of Eastern Current, uh, whether you watched on YouTube or listened uh, as a podcast. We really appreciate it. Uh, be sure to go leave us a, uh, a five-star review if, if we've earned it on iTunes. It helps us out a bunch. And uh, definitely go check out Patreon if you want some extra content. But until next time, have a great day.